everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's program. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute, and it's a delight to welcome you and to welcome our co-chair, Yusai Khan, for what promises to be a very short but sweet introduction um, to one of her favorite things that reminds her about, um, that's important to her about China. I just wanted to say a word or two before I hand it over to our SVP for programs, Dinda Elliott. Um, how important the mission of China Institute is at this time. Um, so much is happening with the screaming headlines around us and the world events that are happening that it's so important for an institution like China Institute, which has been here since 1926, to help us um, better understand and connect with the people of China. And I can't think of a better way to do this than through our co-chair Yusai Khan's introduction. I first went to China when everything was a sea of gray and blue. Those were the two choices. And I'm so excited to get forward to listen to Yusai talk about what it was like to introduce color to China in the 1980s and 90s. So why don't I pass it over to Dinda Elliott who will introduce Yusai in the program. Hello, and welcome to Pieces of China, a series that tells the story of China one object at a time. We are so honored to be joined today by the one and only Yu Sai Khan. And we're just as honored that this episode is generously sponsored by our wonderful friend, Yuan Dan, also known as Dan Dan, who joins us, I think, today from Budapest. Thank you so much for your support, Yuan Dan. We're so grateful for that. Um, you know, it's really impossible to overstate the important role that Yu Sai Khan played in the 1980s and 1990s in China as a human bridge connecting China with the U.S. just as the country was emerging from the dark years of the Cultural Revolution. Her hugely popular One World TV show gave many Chinese their very first glimpse of the outside world. And then she launched China's first cosmetics brand, which reintrodu reintroduced the very concept of beauty to women. Forbes magazine once said that Yusai changed the face of China, quote, one lipstick at a time. And I know I have many friends who remember very, very warmly the very first time they used lipstick or mascara in China, and it was Yusai Khan uh, Cosmetics. So Yusai is joining us from Hawaii, where it is very early in the morning, I might say. So Yusai, thank you so much for getting up so early. That's the first thing, thank you. So Yusai, let's get right to it. Um, we're talking about Yusai brand lipstick, and we have some photographs too that we'll share with everybody as, um, as we're talking. Uh, the year is 1992. Most Chinese are still getting to and from work on bicycles. Mao suits are still everywhere. Um, how did the Chinese look at lipstick at that moment, Yusai? And what was the most popular color when you first, first brought that lipstick to China? There are two kinds of reactions for, with my makeup and lipsticks in China. One kind is very much against it. That's what they say, okay. And the other kind is really excited. This is exactly the reaction when I gave a, a speech in Fudan University. Afterwards, the school had a strong, very vigorous debate as to whether they should use makeup or not. But I think generally speaking, that era of China, there was a, a, a feeling of, of excitement. There is a feeling of wanting to open up. So the, the fact that we became really, really successful is a testament to, testament to how much the Chinese at that time wanted to learn about the West, wanted to try everything new. They were excited, they were curious, and they certainly were buying. So I was very excited. And at that time, the lipstick was only 59 yuan, which is really very small at this uh, compared to today, right? But I tell you, they, it, was, it was sold out. We were selling a million lipsticks a, a month, a lipstick a month, you know, in those days. So, um, so, so we, we, of course, we were having advertising everywhere and promoting it everywhere. And, and I think you, you asked me the question whether whether over oh, that is a huge billboard, you know how big that is. This is, entire, you know, this is a, I think that's how, why I, we send it to you. And um, and I, I tell you because the people were ready for something. It is don't forget it's been a long time since 1949 when 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 the opening came when the liberation came in 1949. It, 
people were so influenced by leftist ideology. And at that time, you know, remember then followed by the Cultural Revolution and all that until 76, everything to do with beauty was not talked about and was truly abandoned. It was not until 1979 when Deng Shopping really opened the, the country up for, uh, for, for what, the, what, what we call the open door policy, that people were beginning to actually change, they beginning to think, wow, we want to try to be uh, not just, we want to be colorful. I mean, that of course is very natural. And I remember so clearly those days when um, the kind of the curiosity about the outside world was so profound and people were so excited to try new things. And it was, it was an incredibly exciting moment. I know you were very much part of, part of the scene. So, so you said, why did you choose Shanghai to open your first but, store? Look, this gives you a little sense of a little bit of what uh, what you said was up against kind of in trying to bring cosmetics to this country. Well, why, why Shanghai? If you, if you look at it, this particular picture right behind it is all this construction going on during that period of time. China was really going through a very big dramatic uh, um, uh, uh, trans transformation. Shanghai is the, is the most westernized and the most open city in, in, in China. Uh, there's no question about it. It was like this and you still it was before the, the liberation and it was like that after the liberation you, then Shanghai still was the most uh, most uh, westernized and I figured that Ch Shanghai was far enough from Beijing and you know you want to do something <laughs> uh, <laughs> look at look how beautiful the the the, the the windows of uh, our brand, right? And, and you know, Shanghai, Shanghai, I figured that if I couldn't be successful in Shanghai, I couldn't be successful anywhere. And I wanted to have a place like Shanghai to test the market, also to make sure that we corrected all the mistakes. We wanted to make sure that as a new company, we want to have sufficient time to learn about uh, our customer, to learn about what we could have done wrong. So Shanghai was a very, very good choice. In fact, uh, we did uh, only three cities. We did the we did some market studies before, and Shanghai was the first one we did. And I'm and I'm basically, basically, I I myself love Shanghai. And was Shanghai an instant success? Extraordinary. Uh, if you see pictures of of me us in in the stores. Uh, I think Aaron might have pictures of me in the stores. It's swamped. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I couldn't go anywhere without police guarding me in the stores. And if the stores knew that I was coming, they make sure that things were totally guarded. And uh, as a matter of fact, they, they thought I would be scared. I wasn't at all. Chinese were so kind and so sweet, even though we were swamped with people. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Never did I ever feel that I was going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. The next photograph is one I kind of love because it kind of captures, again, the spirit of the times. So when this makes me, th I don't know if this is actually in Beijing, but it certainly makes me think of Beijing. So when you launched in Beijing in 1994, um, how were you and your makeup received there? And I, as I recall you saying that you ended up giving a beauty lecture to the wives of China's top leaders or something like that, right? Tell us about yeah. that. Well, uh, what you're looking at this picture is that is lectures. You know, I promoted cosmetics in China in many, many different ways. Of course, on television, on radio, articles I wrote. And one of the most important things I did was physically, I gave a lot of lectures like this. And, and it was all over, I don't even know what this was. And if, if I were to appear in a lecture like this, it would be packed with people. And yeah. and uh, and these people, you know. So I, you, you read the slogan. It says to all the Asian women with love. Yeah. Really, really talking about Chinese women, right? So at at that time, uh, I was when I launched uh, uh, Beijing. I was very very nervous. Uh, come back to me. Uh, very, I was very nervous because all I really needed was some funny daddy. Uh, you know, Chinese Aaron, leader. you can go back to you size face. Yeah. What, 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 I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to say is that, you know, all I needed was to make, what I, 
what am I talking about? I kept looking for my face. That's okay. No, what I'm dying to hear about is Beijing. When you, you were nervous, you're, you're in the capital was, of China. I was very, very nervous about Beijing because all I needed was a leader who says, oh, this is bourgeois. We really don't want this, right? I mean, this could have happened and then my dream would be dashed completely. But to my absolute surprise, Li Peng, who is Li Peng's wife, you know, uh, gave a, a, a luncheon for all the vice premier's wives. And he wanted me to tell them what makeup was all about, all about. So I was very, uh, very, very happy because I wanted to tell the Chinese people, particularly Chinese leaders, you know, and as particularly feder uh, the members of the Women's Federation, it just such how, what, the, the cosmetics in itself is really not that important. Can we come back to my face, yes. Aaron? Yes, so Aaron, you can, you can put the slides away for a minute and just have Yusai speaking. Yeah, there we go. So Great. I was trying to tell them that you know, makeup is it's just a tool. It's not that important. The important part is the spirit of the, of the cosmetics. What is the spirit? The spirit is that if you don't like your mouth, you use makeup. <laughs> To correct it. If you don't like your nose, you can use makeup to correct it. <laughs> if you can correct what you don't like about yourself, wow, this is an important message. If you can correct what you don't like by physically, then you can do anything with yourself. This is a form for me, an emancipation for women. It is extremely um, important that they understand the real spirit of my cosmetic uh, you know, behind it. And also, if they do use my cosmetics, I want them to understand how to use them, which is very important in part of uh, selling, isn't it? Yes. So if they pink lipstick, what kind of clothes would they, should they be wearing? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so if they're wearing an orange lipstick, what clothes should they be right. wearing? You and know, you so, said, what, so, if I could just jump in for a second, tell me what, what was the re reaction of the, the wives of the leaders? I mean, this is like, you know, all the borough people. Um, but the most, the, the most fantastic and very obvious reaction was from the head of Women's Federation. For those of them you, you don't know about Women's Federation, it's almost like a semi-governmental organization that is for the betterment of women in China. And, uh, and I remember Peng Peiyuan, who was the head of, of Federation at that time, was this short little squatty looking woman really little woman and she was already in her 60s at that time she wanted so much to learn about cosmetics she had all her top uh, uh, people in a lecture i gave i gave a lecture to them and she said why don't you make up on my face and i said I would be <laughs> So the, the first thing I did was to put lipstick on her face, right? And then after fixing the lipstick, she said, well, what about skin? So I went on this. And that I said, is what historic. About that is truly historic. That, that's truly historic. And, and they really, really wanted to, you know, and I was saying to them, I said, I am so nervous because I, I, I may be criticized by some, 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 bureaucrats, you know, some leaders. And he said, he said it really clearly to me. He says, don't you worry about it. If somebody criticizes you, come back to me, come back to a Women's Federation. We are your, how do you translate Liangjia? Your, 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 your mother-in-law's home. You know, yeah, your, yeah, your, yeah. your home, your, your, your that's a yeah. very, very, very good endorsement to get. That's a very good endorsement to get. That was really, so with that, you know, I mean, then, then there was absolutely no stopping with you my had it made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I remember you saying that um, in that year, they had a women's conference. So they were also in a hurry to kind of learn stuff beforehand. They didn't really, they, they knew they were behind. And they, they thought that maybe I could be the one to help them to, to, well, to be well, more Western. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a women's, women's, the first women's uh, conference in Beijing. So I want to show a couple more photographs because we have some photos here of you visiting the Daqing oil field, which I just love so much. Um, and then we've got the number one department store in Shanghai. So we'll look at those in a second. But, you know, it looks like Beatlemania. Honestly, it's just insane. So what was that like? And why did so many people show up? Well, well, first of all, in those years, 
there was no celebrities, yes, you know. I, I was probably the first, especially foreign celebrity. And that was number one very important thing. And, and as I said, I was also very, uh, very much of a curiosity for them as well. So you, when you go to a place like Da Qing oil field, it is a very, very big piece of news that I was coming. And you know, what you're looking at is only very small portion of the entire square where I appeared. The, the, where I appeared that the, I think that the whole, whole town of Da Qing came out to receive. <laughs> I bet and, they did. Yeah, they really did. They really, let's take another look at another picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we have, I think this might be the Shanghai department store. Um, and then we've got, yeah. yeah. And, and then you see again, you know, the news media is surrounding you and, you know, is a major, major phenomenon. Um, so women back then, they were really determined to copy, right? They had to copy to learn about beauty. Um, they didn't have their mother to teach them, right? So they needed you, Sai. Uh, let's look at the next photograph. They really were turning to you. That was the first book, uh, no, sorry, that was the second book I published in China. It's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a book that taught them how to use makeup. And that book was selling all over the city. And, and uh, uh, yes, uh, when, when, we, when we grew up, when we grew up in the in the West, uh, our first uh, model obviously was our mother, and I remember smearing lipstick of my mom on my lips and wearing her high heel shoes. But if you think about it, the Chinese in China did did not have mothers like that. The mothers were wearing mao jackets throughout her entire life. So to you know, yeah. to somebody like myself, you know, wearing wearing very colorful clothes and using makeup was an absolute novelty. I'm very sure of it. Look at and this. I just love this. You're giving a makeup lesson. Oh, yes. I did it all over the country, all over the country. And, so, uh, in, and you could tell that I work very hard, right? <laughs> yes, of course, always very hardworking. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we Americans, we so often forget where this very modern China of today was just 30 or 40 years ago. And I think that's kind of, to me, the beauty and the um, kind of importance of these photographs that we're looking at. I want, I want to hear you talk a little bit more about what you remember of that moment in Chinese history when China was just beginning to open up. It was a, an air of excitement. At that time, China had no, no, uh, uh, no corruption at all. All the Chinese leaders I knew were very, very dedicated to opening China up. And that was very, very touching. And they were, if it was somebody like me, let's say that I was about to go to China and I hear that the leaders would get together and say, what should we talk to Yusai about? You know, and that's to me, it was an extraordinary experience. And, and um, you know, but the, but the, acceptance, the, 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 the willingness to try new things. The, mm -hmm. There was, was you, don't forget, you know, in 1979, it was, it, 1989, it was starting, that was Tiananmen, right? So mm -hmm. I was at the time, it began, at the time when all these things were exploding and there was no stopping of it. And in, just to give you an ex, ex, example, my accountant told me in my Tianjin office that people would take a suitcase of, of, of money, suitcase of money, go into her office and say, I'm not going to leave until you give me cosmetics. Here's the money. And that's <laughs> how eager they were, a very, they were really, really eager to, um, to, to, to be westernized. Right. And it was Can a- talk it, a little bit? To I'm sorry to go ahead. It was an exciting time and I was yes. very, very proud to be yes. part of it. Yeah, absolutely. You were an incredibly important part of it. So, so as a final question, I really wanted you to look at China today a little bit and kind of how, what kind of progress has been made and what, what, you know, talk about beauty today. Is it totally different fashion today? What, what do you see today? You know, what's truly interesting. When you study the old China, for example, Tang Dynasty women, you will see pictures of them using everything that we use today. Uh, eyebrow pencil, foundation powder, lipstick and rouge and 
nail polish even in those years. So what 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 we did was trying to bring back all that custom, right? All 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 all, all that. Um, to the, uh, I'm writing my biography, and and uh, the last chapter probably was the most important because the last chapter is a huge chapter of how I look at what is happening to what happened then when I first entered 40 years ago and today what is happening all over China. So I think that, you know, and, and you're asking a question that I almost impossible to, 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 to answer you because it's taken me now almost a month to try to write one single chapter because everything is changed. Everything is different today. And, and of course, the saddest part of all is, as we know, why we have China Institute. The saddest thing is that, you know, there is, is it, it makes me feel that everything so many of us have done all these years to, to promote Chinese-US relations has been wiped out in one stroke, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and somehow, somehow, uh, you know, trust and everything needed to be absolutely rebuilt again, one object at a time. Yes. One thing time. So I think that that you know the, the you know the, the excitement in China today is that is extremely advanced in everything that you look at. But the the sad thing is that now we are we are looking at a China that is being isolated, being uh, pushed uh, pushed back, and um, and. Um, being made into a stinky thing, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that what we really, what, what I really would like to say at, at, at the end is that it's no matter what I say, you say, any one of us say about China today, the most important thing is that those people who don't like China or have no idea about China or, or really should go to China. And you know, you need to be in China and you look at all the good and the bad, and then you make up your mind because yeah. what media has actually told you all the bad things about China that, that I, I can read, okay? And you, you, you need, as an intelligent human being, you need to go there and look at it yourself. You make a decision, whether you like it, not like it, you hate it, you love, whatever, doesn't matter you need to make an informed decision. Brilliant. Conclusion. Brilliant, Yusai. Thank you so much. That's a brilliant conclusion. Um, we need to be educated. We really need to know. Um, and I'm afraid because the sort of conceit of these little bite-sized pieces of China episodes is that they're very short, so we have to stop here. But I promise you that we will try very hard to get Yusai Khan to come back again. We'll definitely get you when your memoir is finished, Yusai, I hope and hopefully long before then as well, um, to share insights about beauty, fashion, modernization, everything about China. And I want to urge everybody to become members of China Institute because by doing so, you will help us bring great speakers like you, Khan, to our diverse array of programs. And you will help us add nuance to the conversation about this very, very complicated, complex country that we're all trying to learn about. Um, as always, you can watch the Pieces of China episodes on our YouTube page. And please join us for our next episode on September 24th with the re renowned conductor, Tsai Jin Dong, who is going to, who's the founder of the US China Music Institute at Bard. And he is going to talk about a concert of American music that he performed in Shanghai in 1997 and why it matters today. So you and he decide, asked him about the book he wrote on Beethoven. Yes, absolutely. It's a brilliant book. Amazing book. And, and you bet. You bet. It was so interesting at that time. I, I also, can I say something? I want to thank yes. Dan. I want to really thank Yuan Dan, my dear friend. And I know she is in Budapest. And I am so grateful to you for sponsoring this segment. Thank you, Dan Dan. We love you. Um, and you, Sai, we love you too. And I want to thank you so much for helping us tell the story of China. Thank you. <laughs>